How was everybody's morning, yeah? yeah. Do you need, does anybody need a stretch before we start? Okay, cool. So my name is Irina. I am, uh, some people know me as Ira, either way, whichever works for you. I'm a developer in all things JavaScript, and you can find me on their interwebs by the following handles of things. All right, and today I would like to talk about building interactive NPM command line modules, all of the things. Um, and let's move on. <laughs> so I want to talk about some of the things that, you know, said set, set some groundwork. Um, uh, the command line modules I write are in Note, and that's basically what I'll be talking about. But obviously, whatever I talk about doesn't have to be specifically in Node. It could be written in Shell. It could be applied to Shell scripts. It could be applied to Ruby gems, Python scripts. Um, and I will be referring to the command line modules as CLI modules for the rest of the presentation. And I like writing mine in Node, because I, I basically can do the same thing in any other possible language. Um, basically because of the JavaScript community, um, which is wonderful to work with. And there are just so many tools available that I can plug in into whatever I'm writing, and I don't have to rewrite them again. And they're basically built for my convenience and delight. And somebody's got, you know, somebody's, it, it's nice to get by with a little help of your friends, basically, the Beatles said it right. Or um, it's nice to get by with a little help of the tools that are available to me. Um, all right. So what's a command line module? Because some people might not know what that is. Um, essentially, it's a program that you interact with um, inside your terminal or your command line or your command prompt. Um, the ones you're most likely available are um, mcdir, make directory. It's actually a command line module um, that's built into Unix. Um, another one, git init. Also, one that you would work with. Doesn't work, the GIF. Um, and another one, npm init. No? Um, kind of three that you're familiar with, more or less. Um, so, programming is. Um, very similar to art for me, a creative process that requires you making creative um, things, building things with your hands, um, make, making, making art, but making it through a program. Um, and to make a successful art piece, uh, we often must play, place limitations um, on ourselves to actually get creative. And otherwise, we're just stuck in like this paradox of choice and 179 options of salad dressing that Barry Schwartz talked about um, in his tech talk, being kind of paralyzed by choice. And so we kind of sit there, and it's like, what I have so many options when I build my tool, and what do I do with myself, and like, how do I approach this problem when there's you know 179 ways of solving it? Um, so when we're faced with a task uh, to do on the website of things of our projects, um, the sheer possibility kind of becomes really limiting and really um, stressful, which is why it's so interesting to work with um, command line interface, because you're limited to just working with the command line, and you're limited to just one screen, and you're limited to colors, and you're unable to kind of work um, with any of the fancy things that the web provides for you. And it's kind of refreshing, and it gets you to be to solve problems in a very creative ways, I think. Um, and given that you are in a command line, you can you can do a bunch of different things with the tools that you already have built in within your applications at work or side projects that you're working on. Um, so how can we um, accomplish this on the command line and keep that same awesome user experience? Um, and I think this kind of
this Google Hangout. So have they told you about how we hooked this up? I should tell you about how we hooked this up. We'll take a pause. So this computer is hooked up to this project, to this monitor that I have my speaker notes on, and then I am Google Hangouting my presentation <laughs> to that computer, and that computer now projects it to the screen, which is why there is a lag. Don't you love, love, love Linux machines? Okay. <laughs> 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 so, um, and also, and as I was saying, an awesome thing for me to kind of accomplish that user experience is to be able to do one thing and one thing well, as um, the Unix senseis have mentioned before, and, you know, it's kind of that minimalist approach to solving problems. Um, so basically, the Unix philosophy, and that's kind of the solution to working with building those interactive and user-friendly command line experiences um, and being able to work with those same constraints that the command line provides for you in, in your of uh, working with a browser. Um, so the key here is actually the, the Unix design patterns that we may have done in school or we may have never done in school or um, we may have heard of or we may not have heard of. So I think to dive into this a bit more will actually give us a little bit um, a little bit more perspective. So kind of, th there's, there's maybe 10 or eight to, eight to 10 different kind of patterns you can implement when you work with the Unix-like uh, command line. I'm gonna talk about four that are sort of the ones I've used uh, quite frequently. Um, that's filter, cantrip, source, and ED pattern. Um, and they're kind of, you, you've, you've used them before in terms of you might have used a tool that uses that, or you might have implemented it yourself. So, so filter is pretty awesome. That's kind of like a grep. Um, all it takes is it takes an input and grabs or filters stuff out of um, that input and gives you an output. Um, Another kind of thing is sort or TR on the command line um, that you would use with the Linux. And then kind of you pass it in the argument, you tell it where to look for just like the usual grep works. Um, and a way that I've done it before is uh, I built this, this was my first command line module and all it did was, if the GIF is gonna work, all it did is it took, it took a string and just output it a picture of a, or actually output it. I would put it. <laughs> I'm not that slow of a typer, I swear. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Close the string, okay. I would put in a picture of a wombat. So this is like the very first kind of module to work with, and all it took is a string and an argument to make the wombat yellow, and it outputted that argument. So kind of like that, that filter function takes an output, modifies it, and outputs it back. Um, and there are obviously like way more complicated ways that you can do this. Um, Source is kind of a similar, it's a filter-like function. Um, PS is, um, is a similar one. So it basically it takes no input, and the output is based on the startup condition or the current conditions that you have. So PS kind of looks at whatever is happening right now. Um, and that's kind of it. Or I, I guess another example you could say is that when you're dealing with Node, you could be looking at the current directory and seeing like what's happening there and then dealing with that as you pipe it to a different kind of um, uh, Unix pattern that you wanna work with. Cantrip is, is uh, oh, well. <sighs> cantrip, okay, so make, uh, make directory is a, is a type of cantrip. So what this does is, um, it basically, it takes no arguments, and all it does is create something based on whatever arguments you do, and, oh, okay. Slides. Okay. 
Are we? And then another example, oh my God, I'm really sorry about this. <laughs> okay, and another one that I've done was um, it takes, so basically it takes, one, takes an argument and does something based on whatever your functions described. I was recently working with, um, I was recently in Lebanon to work on um, a data visualization project for one of the human rights organizations. And I needed to write a scraper that would basically take all of their information in. And I chose to make it into a command line module. And my little cantrip, all it did is told my program to scan. And it would scan the particular uh, page or scrape the particular page that I needed. And then um, it's not very pure in terms of what the function did. And then it put it into the JSON. Um, According to like the Unix philosophies, technically you should try to keep your output as pure as possible. So turning it into JSON is not very uh, Unix philosophy in terms of that. But basically, just kind of use, um, give it one kind of input, and then it deals with the output on its own. Okay, I think we need a wombat break. <laughs> if we can get the GIF to work, that is. We can't, that's okay. And if I can get this slide to change, obviously too. <clears throat> Wow, okay, now this is. Okay, so the next one's kind of um, the ED pattern. Um, sorry about the lack of wombats. Um, so basically what a ED does, um, it takes a file and modifies the output file. So I was, I'm working on something called a um, command line texting module. So basically allows a user to text within the command line. And one of the aspects of that project is for the user to be able to set up um, their own config files. These are like totally arbitrary uh, numbers I'm inputting in. Um, but the idea is for the user to be able to add their kind of uh, information and then for me to write that file. Um, and most of the times the file already exists, so we're modifying that particular file. And I'll give an example um, a little later as I go through the actual code. Um, so given those particular patterns that we talked about, um, what might be the general guidelines for writing interactive CLEs? I think that's kind of what we want to talk about. Um, and as I've been working with some of them over the past couple of months, I kind of came up with a little list that I like to use um, when I start on a new project. I try to work with giving options to users. I think it's super important to be able to give a user as to what they want to modify and how they want to um, work with, a with your program, whether it's commands or arguments, um, and they would be able to specify. Um, it, you never know whether users used your program before, if they've ever used um, command line modules before, so they might not know the particular patterns that Git or NPM use, which are very similar, so kind of verbose options help. And I mean, you don't have to reinvent the, the wheel. There's a bunch of them that already parse the options for you that you will be able to kind of work with and set them up. Um, and there is a real life example of very tiny and very dark, um, that I worked with before to set up the command line texting module. So basically I have, um, I have three commands uh, that the, modules, the module uses. One start, one is config, and one is add. And two of them kind of have their options. So if a user goes to start um, the conversation, they can um, add different options of who they want to start the conversation with, so that's the option with to the command start. Um, 
or if they're um, just going through config, I work with the config option and then parse that option later on. And I used YARGs, but I mean, they're all kind of the same in that regard. Um, mainly YARGs because their documentations in pirate speak, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> Um, I like to set up some defaults for argument parsing because that's that's really neat and sometimes with especially config files you kind of sometimes you set those up already and you, the user doesn't have to modify them afterwards um, so I sometimes would set that up already and then don't have to worry about it and it's nice and neat in terms of that um, super important one is Log your errors. It's it's really it's really really crucial because um, the program could be terminated. The user doesn't know what happens, and then it just kind of works like that, and the program explodes. So it's really important to kind of walk your user user through, um, even if it's um, with errors or just without errors. Again, you never know if the user has used your program before or has used a command line program before in general, and just kind of taking them by the hand and saying, OK, we're going to do this now, and we're going to do this now, just like you would in the browser, or you would in the command line. It's enough exploding in the face. Um, so we talked about four kind of different um, Unix design patterns. And kind of combining them together um, is pretty neat, because then you are able to kind of work with different concepts and actually progress your program a little further. Um, so I think that kind of increases the possibilities of the different things you could do. Um, so the possibilities yeah, are pretty much endless at that point. Um, so with the, the, with the fact that um, you can pretty much build anything, work with your existing API, and get your coworkers to um, um, handle certain things via that command line module, uh, you could um, build a node module that has a command line extension. So, for example, you're just building some sort of abstraction, and you know your your program is just supposed to use that. But what if you abstract certain things out and just write some um, option parsing, and then you're able to make it um, a command line extension and a cron job? Because I mean, you could write shell scripts, um, but I mean, Node's so much more fun, and it's asynchronous. So why not write it in Node and then just make it um, a cron job? And I mean, you can build all three together, and that's kind of fun, too. Um, use tools. I think that's pretty important, because Node has so many awesome tools you could use. There is um, FS, everybody, or so many people use FS, I think, to be able to get things done, to write a file, read a file, and things like that. Um, and then again, we can pipe it to the existing patterns we've already built out. And if the tools are there for you, you might as well use them. Um, already and exploit the tools you have like doing your laundry and stuff uh, <laughs> that was a one butt break and the one of the uh, one of the kind of really important things is building your tools with empathy um, it's not everybody who uses the product that you've built out uh, has a Mac, for example. So testing on different machines is super important. As a Linux user, that sometimes I get left out. <laughs> um, not everybody's used a command line product before. It's really important to be able to kind of, again, guide them through the presentation. What would you do if you were in their shoes? Um, and you know, being able to kind of um, work even if it's just built out for your coworkers and not for the open source community in general, you should still be able to kind of uh, build it out so it's not just for your own use and you kind of will remember. And if you think about it, if you open up whatever you've written three or four months ago, um, you will not necessarily remember which kind of options you've set out your program to have if they weren't verbose and it just said dash M. Um, and how am I doing for time? I thought, uh, I kind of rushed through this, but I, now that I have a little bit more time, I can show you one of the projects that I'm working on right now, which hopefully I can with the screencasting thing on. Um, 
I worked with the three. So on line 13, it was number one that started with the start. Um, and what that would do is just start a server for the text messaging to go through. And, and 26 would set up the config, which you can probably barely see. Um, and then that would kind of launch my, um, the prototype that I have for the config file and work through the particular arguments that the user parses. And um, add would add a particular user to the, um, to the already existing config file if you wanted to text with other people. I don't think I can zoom in, so I won't go into, into too much detail because that's probably just really painful on the eye. I'll end it here. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I think that. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this was a pleasure. And again, sorry for the technical difficulties. Oh. <laughs>